Okay, hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and uh, um, welcome. I'm sorry I'm a few minutes late. I was on this terrific phone call um, listening to some new technology in terms of education, and uh, that was, um, that was, it was, it was, we'll talk about that at a different time, uh, but, um, you know, it was actually not medical education, it was education um, for s uh, people born after 2010, so millennials, trying to look at how um, you can develop education. And this is a company that wasn't started because of COVID and kids being home, but it was a company that was um, basically st uh, started because um, the people who, the person who was founded the company was disappointed in the education and teaching and the, and the lack of moving things forward, that education has been kind of uh, stagnant, which we all know, and that's education for children, education for high school, education for college, where, as he mentioned, everything is made to be able to take exams and memorize a lot of facts, and education needs to be more about skill sets, that as we go forward into the 21st century, the skill sets become more and more important, so it's a question of how you develop those skill sets, and it's really, um, it's spectacular what, what they're doing. I'll post some stuff about that on CT as Us, but it's just, and it's just a tremendous, uh, tremendous opportunity. Uh, and we're gonna have a talk on June 4th, so I took care of that today, so it's really very excited about that. Um, today, first of all, let me just say, I hope everyone is doing well in this um, craziness. I just will remind everyone, as all of you know, and are smart, that although things are opening, you still need to be probably more careful than ever as more people are around and not everybody follows their uh, is smart you need to be really really careful so I'll, I'll just make those comments and um, the topic today is going to be uh, liver masses and CTA so uh, one of the things I've been doing uh, now is um, on Wednesdays I used to give every other week a conference to the faculty now I'm giving to extended faculty residents fellows faculty and I'm showing cases and I've had a lot of cases from even a few years ago, which I never had time to get to final path. So I'm going back and realizing this things we put aside have been incredible cases. It's also made me think about how we look at problems. And also it made me also think about how we do training and this conversation even more so. But the training issue is really an interesting one. And how do you look at things? And so today I'm supposed to talk about liver masses and CTA. Now we could say, Look at liver mass. Is there a, how do you do it on CT? Okay. First of all, you need the right protocols. We all know that a non contrast, you're going to miss a lot. We also know that if you only have delayed phase imaging, many lesions are going to become isodense and you may not see them. We also know that just saying someone has a mass, it could be anywhere from a cyst to hemangioma to hepatic adenoma to focal nodular hyperplasia to an abscess to hepatoma, to metastasis, and lymphoma, and you go on and on. So in saying that, we need to figure out, not that we can give long differential diagnosis lists, that's something you did as a resident perhaps, but the question is how can you be more specific? How can you in fact tell people exactly what's going on and what needs to be done and be more specific? Can you target things a lot better? So that indeed becomes very, very important in that regard. So one of the things I've noticed, one of the best things is on multiphase imaging, the ability to look at the vessels. So in a sense, when you give IV contrast, particularly with a good injection of four or five cc's a second, what you're really dealing with is a, in a sense a CTA, right? Well, you can look at the vascular map. So now think about it for a second. I have a lesion. I'm defining it. Does it enhance or does it not enhance? Water density, solid. Water density, no enhancement, no nodularity, simple cyst. Can be small, can be big, can be multiple. If things are cystic, it could be other things. It could be an abscess, but there the there is some enhancement, and often it's a regular enhancement, and there's often some nodularity or regularity. We talk about cysts, like hydatid cysts, but then there are multiple septations in the cysts, and 70% of the time is calcified. So you have other findings. Now you have a solid mass. It's not a cyst. Then we look at enhancement. Is it enhancing at all? If it's enhancing, is there peripheral enhancement? Or is it diffuse enhancement? 
or is it just central enhancement? If you talk about peripheral enhancement, how does it look? Is it around the edge and what we would describe as puddling, and does it fill in from peripheral to central? Then we're talking about hemangioma. Hemangiomas don't become isodense typically unless they're small, because often there's a central scar. But that indeed works pretty, pretty well, okay? But what if the whole lesion is enhancing, the whole periphery is enhancing at once, and it's irregular, and well, that's a tumor. Uh, it could be a hepatoma, it could be a cholangiocarcinoma, it could be a neuroendocrine tumor that's from many different possibilities that are vascular, renal cell, neuroendocrine, breast at times, uh, kidney, I probably said that already. So we look at that pattern. I also look carefully at the vessels. Is there a vessel going into the lesion? Now, is the vessel normal in caliber or is it big? Is it smooth? or is it irregular? Think about FNH. It has a vessel, usually it's not that big, but sometimes it gets bigger, but it goes right to the center of the lesion where the central scar is. If you have a hepatoma, there are multiple vessels and the vessels are irregular. If it's a cholangiocarcinoma, multiple vessels and the vessels are irregular. If it's a neuroendocrine tumor, multiple vessels and the vessels are large and spiculated and irregular. So how the vessels look become very, very important to us in terms of how we define the lesion. We then also look at how the lesion behaves as you go from arterial to venous to delay. Now, we don't always have all the phases, and typically we recommend two phases, arterial and venous. If it's enhancing, does the enhancement persist? Does the lesion become isodense or brighter? Hepatic adenomas, focal nodular hemangiomas, will become at times fill in and become less well visualized. Hepatic adenomas can also have calcification and can have areas of bleeding or potential bleeding. Um, if you think about uh, some of the other things we can consider, hepatomas, variable in terms of vascularity, but often the underlying liver is cirrhotic. So now I look with my vascular map at what does the liver look like? Yes, we could see hepatomas in non serotic livers, but that's uncommon. Maybe it's more likely hepatic adenoma, which can pro progress to hepatoma. But if I see a le liver that's definitely nodular and it's serotic, big cordae, low big fissure, fissures, then I know I have to look very carefully uh, and assume anything I see is going to be a hepatoma. The vascularity of a lesion within a serotic liver if it looks like hemangioma, I'm not calling hemangioma because hemangiomas are vascular pools in a cirrhotic liver, they collapse. Mike Federley wrote that years ago. And so when I see a vascular lesion, I almost don't care how it looks. To me, it's a hepatoma till proven otherwise, whether it's one centimeter or it's 10 centimeters. Okay, that becomes very, very important. So now I'm looking at the texture of the liver and the, the vascular map will often show me the texture. Are the vessels stretched? Is there pruning or is the vessels branching normally? And now I look at the arterial side, I look at the venous side. Now the venous side probably doesn't help me quite as much because portal vein and SMV is more spread of disease in the sense that hemangiomas, cysts, typically FNHs, even hepatic adenomas are not going to cause portal vein thrombosis. Uh, I've seen maybe a case or so of uh, hemangioma, but then it was giant 20 centimeter cavernous hemangiomas, and that's simply not going to be the case. On the other hand, if I see something invading the portal vein, then I'm thinking aggressiveness, then I'm thinking hepatoma, cholangio less likely, and at times metastasis. So again, how you approach the vessels and the vascular mapping becomes very critical. So again, venous to me, um, the venous phase obviously is helpful in looking at the lesion enhancement and progression and helping me with differential diagnosis. But in terms of portal vein SMV, the only thing I typically think about is if I see occlusion or invasion, then it's going to be a malignant tumor. So it's helpful in that regard. But the arterial phase to me is really where I get a lot of the information that I need. Now, in terms of lesion periphery and filling in, um, that information, obviously, as you go from arterial to venous, becomes very valuable. But, of course, the, um, the classic thing is hemangioma with that puddling and then filling in central to peripheral uh, with um, a central scar typically common. Remember, in the old days, we assumed that hemangiomas would fill in their entirety. That's no longer the case. 
So let me just say we're about two thirds of the way through at the 10 minute mark. So let me first say hello to Whitney who's joined and you Scott and uh, John Biacchino from Maryland, uh, both in Maryland. John's up the, st up the area in the Timonium. Um, if people have any questions or anything, um, I think this probably, you know, it's a good, t never a bad time to ask questions and I can try to get to them, but don't wait till I finish and then expect me to answer them after uh, we're on YouTube and we're on Facebook Live, but it's recorded, so it's a good time to do it. Now, um, in terms of, you know, liver, uh, someone asked me about, uh, are we seeing anything different in the liver in COVID patients? It's interesting, in, in terms of the abdomen, obviously we know about the lungs and we know looking for infiltrates. We also know we're seeing many more PEs. We're also seeing a lot more cases of retroperitoneal bleeds, and it seems to me without any good statistics, GI bleeds. But I've seen a lot of patients with retroperitoneal bleeds. You've seen now a lot of the COVID patients have this coagulopathy. So sometimes they're treating with prophylactically with uh, endocoagulant therapy, which obviously in and of itself can lead to bleeding. But a lot of the articles coming out about COVID is this, this issue with bleeding and coagulopathies. And so it really is an issue. We've seen a lot of patients with abdominal pain and big retroperitoneal bleeds. And as you go from arterial to venous, you can uh, see um, active bleeding. And I've particularly seen that in the psoas muscle, um, occasionally in the rectus muscle, but mainly retroperitoneal bleeds. And it's not like 3CM, this like 10CM bleeds. And uh, I've seen that also a couple times in the upper thighs, but usually it's retroperitoneal. So we've seen that. In terms of liver imaging, I haven't really seen much. I think uh, you've seen congestive changes in the liver because patients have developed all sorts of cardi cardiac issues. and you get reflux of contrast into the IVC and hepatic veins when you have poor cardiac output. Big pleural effusions, pericardial effusions are all things that lead to poor cardiac output and reflux of contrast into the IVC. So, uh, but beyond that, I haven't really seen much and it's probably worthwhile is a few articles from radiology and AJR that speak about the coagulopathy and people have been looking at that, especially um, I would say with ultrasound, but also with CT and far less degree with MR. Now, other things in terms of uh, the vascular mapping, um, volume rendering is really good for defining tumor to vessels and can be used for surgical planning. Volume rendering is also good and particularly cinematic rendering is good for looking at the pattern and the cystic and solid components within hepatic masses, be it benign or malignant. Though I do have to admit the MIP, because it gives you those vessels, and you're not trying to do preoperative planning with MIP, you're just trying to look at things. And so a sliding MIP, about 10 millimeters in thickness, and scroll through. You can widen the MIP if you want to get a lot more of the vessels. The challenge, of course, always is if you have too many vessels, it's kind of obscures thing. And you want to stay away from the kidneys, so I'll do it as a um, coronal MIP slab, but then I'll also do a, a MIP slab sort of starting inferiorly up, so kind of feet to head, and look at the, the vessels in that regard as well. And that works very nicely. There's a bunch of cases on the teaching file in CT as us, and there's some stuff about this also in um, one of our last liver lectures, which may be coming out soon. And I'll probably do this again, maybe focus on this in some of the other uh, talks uh, and create a new talk. I have been working, as I mentioned, about preparing these cases. I have been working and giving cases with slides rather than in, in person with on, on the workstation. And so I am, it's made me think about how to create new lectures for CTSS, including where I'm going to do like, I was working on one today, which is sort of problem solving a large splenic mass, what should you be thinking about? And I'll do that with liver as well. What should you be thinking about? What's the importance of history? Hep B, Hep C. Does the patient have a known primary? What's, what's the patient's age? What's the patient's clinical symptoms? What's some of the lab values perhaps? And then looking at the masses, looking at their enhancement pattern. Um, we Questions also come up, the role of um, PET in patients with liver masses. I think if you have CT lesions which are indeterminate, sometimes MRI can be helpful. Uh, 
but people are often now using PET scans, uh, whether it's, you know, you have an indeterminate lesion in a patient who has pancreatic cancer or some other primary, and you want to know what the stage of the patient is, PET can be very helpful in that regard. So I think that can be very valuable. So let's see, what else? Um, any other questions from anybody? Um, I don't see a show of hands. I know that uh, it's kind of funny. People have more free time now in the sense that uh, people are working from home. A lot of people or people are at work, um, though the staffing models are getting tighter and tighter, particularly the technology side. So I think people have, and people can't remember the time of the day. They can't remember the day of the week. So maybe uh, uh, we, I noticed the last few weeks that we have a massive number of people who listen to these talks after the fact. And it's hard for me to tell how many people are uh, on. I could just simply see how many people are asking questions, which besides you, Scott, is nobody. So I'll leave you with that. We've posted a bunch of new things uh, and new cases on the liver. You might want to look at that. And again, think about that in your practice. If you're not doing MIP, maybe you have a little bit more time now, your volumes are down. Just take some cases, even if you take cases that you know the path from, and then look at them. Look at the vascularity and think about how you could do things differently going forward. So with that, I'll say hi to Celia Marie uh, from Portugal. I hope everything is well there. And um, yeah, I, I'm not gonna get into what you said about healthcare revenue. So I'm sure you read in the papers and probably you're impacted at your own institution, particularly in the Northeast. Volumes were down 70, 75%. They're coming back a little bit, but a little bit means slowly. Um, many people will say with with this year through the end of the year, you know, you're probably at best going to get to 70% of where you were, 80%. You're not going back to 100%. So I, I that would be wonderful if that would happen. But just the sheer fact that you need to do all the cleaning between patients, physicians are seeing less patients, the whole process is going slower. I think all of that's going to be a challenge. So with that, I won't go into any more on the COVID stuff, but... Um, um, have a great day, and whether you're in Montreal with Marianne, or you're in Baltimore as John, or Portugal, or any place in between, um, hope you're safe, and hope things go well, and we'll see you next week. Have a great day. Bye.